Friends, this is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. And we are rejoicing that we got up. We survived the time change, right? We're here. You notice how the light is different in here this morning? That's a blessing. Well, welcome to worship today. A couple of announcements. Um, session meets Tuesday night. Um, Monday night, we are starting a new study for our women's group. Romans. So if you want to join us, this is a perfect time to come. Monday nights we meet from 7 to about 8.30. Um, this one has a video along with it, and we're looking forward to that. Come and join us. Um, also, there are, um, don't forget about Easter lilies, if you want one or more of those um, in honor or memory of a loved one. And we have some good news. Jeff, you want to show us your um, medal? <laughs> Woohoo! Jeff got seventh out of 422. So that is awesome. Way to go, Jeff. Thanks for sharing that with us. Any other announcements this morning? Yes, Mary. I just want, not this Wednesday, but next Wednesday, EW Circle starts again. And I have you all. If you want to do a Bible study with us, it's called Sacred Encounters. And we hope anyone that's interested and likes to study ahead before the meeting, contact me. Awesome. So not... PW Women's Group starts again, not this Wednesday, but the next Wednesday. We meet on the third Wednesday of the month at 9.30. So come and join us, anyone. Any other announcements this morning? All right, let's stay in and sing together. Please join me in the call to worship. Shout with God, excuse me, shout with joy to God, all the earth. Remember, Remember that, that our God, God is, is the only God, God the one who made us, the one who sustains us, the one whose spirit lives within us. Let us enter God's house with thanksgiving and come into God's presence with praise. For God is good with unfailing love that lasts forever and faithfulness that extends to all generations. Let us pray together. Loving God, we thank you for calling us here. We have come to worship you, to praise you for the abundant blessings you have given to us. Remind us we are made in your image and we were created to be generous, just like you. Although we live in the world, as believers, we are not of the world. The culture around us wants us to seek first our pleasure, but your ways are higher, and you call us to seek you first. Help us to be more generous and willing to share with you and with others. In your powerful name we pray. Amen. Let's stand and sing together.
Every week as we worship together, we have the opportunity to admit to ourselves, to each other, and to God that we do not always live as we are called. In this time of confession, this time of opening our hearts, let us remember God is merciful and just, eager to offer grace and love. Let us pray together. Holy One, you are generous, given us far beyond what we could ever have imagined or asked for in giving us your Son. You have the ultimate gift, and it costs you dearly, and yet far too often we hold back. We keep a tight grip on the resources and the time you've given us. You love a cheerful giver, but we sometimes give grudgingly. Too often we hold back ourselves when you are calling us to give ourselves away. Forgive us, Lord, and teach us to loosen our grip. Teach us to give freely, remembering that all we have comes from you and that you can use our gifts to bless the whole world. Amen. The proof of God's amazing love is this, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died on the cross for us. That is the ultimate gift. So let us receive God's gift of forgiveness and give that gift of forgiveness to those around us. We are forgiven and free through Jesus Christ. Let's extend the wave of peace to those around us this morning. Peace be with you. Well, I am so thankful we are chugging right along um, on our cereal. I think we have about 85 boxes, and we are thankful for that. I know that's something, as we mentioned before, that the food pantry, um, with the increased usage, is not purchasing at this time. And if people at your house eat People at the, who come to the food pantry eat as much cereal as people do at my house. They're going to be happy to receive all these boxes. And we're always reminded to bring our favorite kind. If you like it, you know someone else does too. So thank you for everyone who's brought those. All right. Well, this morning I brought a little game. Now, you're, are you going to help me? Are you going to be the kids here? Are you ready to be children? Are you ready to be children? Okay. Oh, okay. you got to love it when the battery goes dead. All right. So this morning I brought some Jenga blocks and I want us to think about, you know, I'm gonna step down here. I want us to think about the things that we are blessed to have. What's something that you are grateful for that you, when you got up this morning? A warm bed. A warm bed, oh yes, okay. Somebody else? Sunshine, oh I love that. You got up. Thank you, Trudy, that's the one I was thinking of. That's a great one, what else? Toast. Oh, I love toast. Okay. Hot shower. Yes. A hot shower. Oh, yes. And you're not heating the water to take a bath, right? What else? Home. Home. Yes. Coffee. Coffee. Ooh, yeah. That one takes two. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I, I thank you. I'm thankful for coffee. I like my caffeine in that, in that way. What else? Hot chocolate. Okay. How many of you got here with a vehicle? Did it start right away? How many people started right away? Okay. My spouse nicely put my remote start on. Remote start is the Thanksgiving, isn't it? Right? How about electricity? Do you enjoy that? How about running water? A peaceful home. Yes. Sue, that is a wonderful one. Right? You didn't have to, it's peaceful in your home and it's peaceful out on the streets, isn't it? Right? What else? The furnace that works. Yes. Health. Health. That's a big one. That's a big one. What else? Family. Family. Oh, yeah. Family gets three. Right? Or maybe if you're like me, I'm, I'm thinking about Easter already in my family. I'd have about 30 with just my extended family. That's a blessing, isn't it? What about food? When you go in the grocery store, can you buy what you want? For, I, I mean, not steak. Some people at my house want to eat steak every day. We're not going to eat steak every day, right? But we have food every day, don't we? Okay. We don't have to hunt it, grow it, catch it, 
All you got to do is put it in the cart, right? And go to the front and have your cart so you can pay for it. That's a blessing. What else? Running water. Running water. You can drink as much as you want. I always think, especially as a, us women, we could be out carrying big buckets of water on our head, right? We're not doing that. What about anybody else? You know what? We really could make a tower a million things, couldn't we? A song, I'm sorry Denise isn't here this morning, because we've been talking about a song that we ought to sing in church, and it's called, it's a Christian song on radio, and it says, it talks about counting your blessed blessings. And it's, he says in the song, I can't count that high. It's true, isn't it? Is we have so many blessings, we could sit here for the rest of the service, couldn't we? And give thanks and praise to God for all the things that he's given to us. So let's pray. God, we have a choice. We have a choice every day about what kind of attitudes we're going to have. Are we going to get up and be grateful? Are we going to grumble about the things that we don't have? Are we going to give you thanks and praise and count all the wonderful ways and all the wonderful things that you've done for us? Thank you for our blessings and help us to keep counting. In your precious name, all God's people said, Amen. Let us pray together. Gracious, Gracious God, God, give us humble, humble teachable, and obedient hearts that we may receive what you have revealed and do what you have commanded. Amen. Our scripture readings this morning, the first one is from Ecclesiastes 2, 1 to 11. Pleasures are meaningless. I said to myself, come now, I will test you with pleasure to find out what is good. But that also proved to be meaningless. Laughter, I said, is madness. And what does pleasure accomplish? I tried cheering myself with wine and embracing folly, my mind still guiding me with wisdom. I wanted to see what was good for people to do under the heavens during the few days of their lives. I undertook great projects. I built houses for myself and planted vineyards. I made gardens and parks and planted all kinds of fruit trees in them. I made reservoirs to water groves of flourishing trees. I bought male and female slaves and had other slaves who were born in my house. I also owned more herds and flocks than anyone in Jerusalem before me. I amassed silver and gold for myself and the treasure of kings and provinces. I acquired male and female singers and a harem as well, the delights of a man's heart. I became greater by far than anyone in Jerusalem before me. In all this, my wisdom stayed with me. I denied myself nothing my eyes desired. I refused my heart no pleasure. My heart took delight in all my labor, and this was a reward for my toil. Yet when I surveyed all that my hands had done and what I had toiled to achieve, Everything was meaningless, a chasing after the wind. Nothing was gained under the sun. And from 2 Corinthians 9, 6 to 12, generosity encouraged. Remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver, and God is able to bless you abundantly, so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work, as it is written, they have freely scattered their gifts to the poor, their righteousness endures forever. Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion and through us your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. 
This service that you perform is not only supplying the needs of the Lord's people, but is also overflowing in many expressions of God's thanks to us. Er, <laughs> in many expressions of thanks to God. Matthew 6, 19 to 24, Treasures in Heaven. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth, but where moths and vermin destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moths and vermin do not destroy, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The eye is the lamp of the body. If your eyes are healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eyes are unhealthy, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light within you is darkness, how great is that darkness? No one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and and money. In San Diego to work with military lingui linguists, a woman checked into a hotel and ordered a 5 a.m. wake-up call. The next morning the phone didn't ring until 5 30. You were supposed to call us at 5 a.m., she admonished the desk clerk at the other end of the line. What if I had to close a million dollar contract this morning? Your oversight would have cost me the deal. Ma'am, he said calmly, if you had to close that type of deal, I doubt you'd be staying in this hotel, type of hotel. <laughs> now, as we continue to explore walking with Jesus, the essential spiritual practices that shape our heart, we turn to the connection between money and the spiritual life. We say to ourselves, what does money have to do with our walk with Jesus? Well, when we read the words of Jesus in the Gospels, we find he speaks more about money about material possessions, then he speaks about worship, prayer, and scripture study combined. Adam Hamilton says, Jesus makes clear that our relationship with money can either sabotage our spiritual life or deepen and support it. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus taught that what we do with our money tells us something about the condition of our heart. Jesus said, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Now, the world tells us the opposite of what Jesus teaches, right? That our lives revolve around the abundance of stuff we own. Our culture says you can be happy, you can be fulfilled if you just had a new car, if you just had the latest phone, if you just had this house. Now, it seems like there are ads about all the things, everywhere there are ads about all the things that we need to have the good life. Now, Adam Hamilton says the phrase, the good life, is shorthand for a fulfilling, a satisfying, a happy life. For many, the good life is defined as having ample money, material possessions, and leisure time. And beneath this common modern definition of the good life is an ancient philosophy the Greeks called hedonism. Now, drawn from the Greek word for pleasure, hedonism is a philosophy that teaches the highest good is pleasure. This is the belief that the chief end of humanity is to maximize pleasure and to minimize your pain. Now, none of us want pain, but if pleasure is your primary definition of the good life and all you do is pursue pleasure, you're never going to be satisfied. Do you, ever some, do you ever have something you want? Remember even when you were a little kid, you had something you wanted so bad you could taste it, right? And you finally get it. You get what you want to go, yippee! Right? And you move into your new house, you put on that new pair of shoes, and you are happy for a time, right? Until the joy of owning it dissipates, maybe when you get the bill. Yeah, and then you find yourself and you want something else. The book of Ecclesiastes is what Bonnie read today. The writers refer to the teacher as traditionally thought to be King Solomon. And you, when you read this book, you're going to find a guy who's devoted his whole life to acquiring, acquiring pleasure and escaping pain. He talks about, did you catch that? He talks about building houses. He plants vineyards. He has herds and flocks and silver and gold. He has singer. He has delights of the flesh. He's got a harem. Did you notice that part? And the message translation says, everything I wanted, I took. I never said no to myself. 
I gave in to every impulse, and I held nothing back. Now, if hedonism is the way to the good life, the teacher in Ecclesiastes would be very happy. But again and again, if you read through Ecclesiastes, he, be, he says this refrain. He says, it's all meaningless. It's pointless. It's vanity. It's a chasing after the wind. Because we know you can chase after the wind, but you're not, you're not ever going to catch it. Now, it's true that possessions and experiences, they can bring us some measure of, of, some measure of pleasure. But when pleasure and possessions are what we live for, we're just chasing the wind. We cannot buy the good life on Amazon, eBay, or even, and now we're watching last night, QVC. So what are the keys to the good life? Well, Adam Hamilton says there are three habits or practices rooted in scripture that play a key part in helping us to experience the good life. The first one is to learn to want what you already have. We talked about this the first Sunday of Lent. Gratitude, giving thanks for what you already possess. You like this picture here? For a while on Facebook, I would find pictures of dream living rooms. Okay, every one of them had white, white couches. Okay. And you ever notice on Facebook, the more I posted pictures like that, the more pictures came to me across my feed. Pictures like this one of the Jumbotron. White couches, lots of fancy pillows, a home that looks absolutely perfect. And you know what I would think to myself? I wish my house looked like this. Now, finally, several nice people on Facebook said, seriously, you have four teenagers, you're going to have white couches? <laughs> Okay, I kind of, it's like I came to. And I realized that all of these fantasy pictures, all they made me do, I'm not saying it's bad to post pictures, but for me, all it made me do was want a different house. And you know what? I have a perfectly lovely house right now. Are you grateful for what you have? It's not wrong. I'm not saying it's wrong to buy a new house or a new car. The point is that we need to take time every day to thank God for what we have. I am grateful for a home with so many windows, with plenty of space for all of us. I'm grateful, for, as I said before, I have a van that always starts, and it has a remote starter, and guess what? It even has heated seats, okay? I have plenty of food. I have clothes. When I'm grateful for what I have, I'm so much more generous toward other people. I want to share the resources God's given me so that others can have what they need. It's interesting that scientific research has found a neurological link between gratitude and generosity. In her article, Why a Grateful Brain is a Giving One, Christina Har Carnes says, in a sense, gratitude seems to prepare the brain for generosity. Counting blessings is quite different than counting your cash because gratitude, just as philosophers and psychologists predict, points us toward moral behaviors, reciprocity, and paying it forward motivations. Our brain literally makes us feel richer when others do well. Perhaps that's why researchers have observed that grateful people give more. Gratitude might be good for us, but it's good for other people as well. Now, the second key to experiencing the good life is to live purposely. The writer of Ecclesiastes found that the life of pleasure is meaningless. To find good life, we need to find what's meaningful. What adds meaning to our lives? What gives us fulfillment, a sense of purpose every day? As Christians, our purpose is not acquiring stuff. It's following Jesus. It's loving God and loving our neighbor. I read about a very unusual military funeral in California in December of 2013. Sergeant First Class Joseph Gant, who fought in both World War II and the Korean War, was laid to rest. He'd been captured in Korea in 1950 and died the following year, but his body was not returned for many years. His death was never confirmed by the North Koreans. And his wife, Clara, waited for decades for her husband to come back. She went to meetings with gover government officials. She even bought a house she had it professionally landscaped so that all Joseph would have to do when he came home was go fishing. And she was 94 years old when his remains were finally brought home for a military funeral. It wasn't the homecoming she dreamed of, but she finally knew his fate, and she said this to a reporter. He told me if anything happened to him, he wanted to, me to remarry, and I told him no. Here I am, still his wife, and I'm going to remain his wife until the day the Lord calls me home. True godly love is not temporary. It's not transient. Love is a commitment that meant, means is meant to last. 
God calls us to love others as God loves us with an unfailing love that never ends. That's why we're on this earth, to love God and to love other people. It's in living this life of love that we find meaning, hope, and life. Now, the third key to finding meaning, happiness, and fulfillment is generosity toward God and other people. I like Adam Hamilton says, we are made for generosity. It is meant to be both the shape of our heart and the way that we live. Generosity is what? It's the act of being kind, selfless, and giving to other people. Je Jesus talked about that. He says, don't store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and vermin destroy and where thieves break in and steal but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven. For where your treasure is, there is your heart. There your heart will be also. We think, where is our treasure? Where's our heart? You know, the only, when we die, they would say that there's no, there's no U-Haul behind the hearse, right? You don't get to take it with you. And so we think about how we can invest more in eternal treasures. Personally, that's one of the, the lessons I learned from my mom's death. You ever had somebody die and you you hold on to the things that they have right my sisters gave me piles of books that she had but God reminded me I don't have to hold on to things I was really struck by the fact that one day I'm gonna die and all the physical stuff I have is gonna be gone I'm not gonna get to take any of it with me so it teaches me it's taught me anyway to learn to hold on to things more loosely I want less stuff I want to be generous with my stuff, my money, my time, we're made to practice generosity. You know, one of the most important ways is we give is to our congregation. This way our congregation has funds to pay the power bills. We have the funds to keep the physical church in good shape. We have the resources for the work of the church inside and outside of our walls. What an incredible gift, how well the church has done financially. And when we individually give our tithes and our offerings as an expression of love and gratitude to God, we make it possible for the church to have an impact on the world around us. One of, the, one of the natural things I think of is how our individual and our church donations have had on Christ covered. And you may think, oh, big deal, I'm bringing two boxes of cereal, okay? But that cereal is, is feeding people physically, and it's also sharing with people at Christ covered the gift of being fed by Jesus Christ, right? When you're serving people at Christ Covered, you're saying, people say, where are these things coming from? You're saying, these are from people who, who know and love the Lord, right? And there's such a special joy that comes from hands-on generosity, from being able to see and talk to the people you help. And by giving, we're putting our love into action. Now, we have a choice about how we give. Are we, are we giving because we feel we must, or, because, or are we giving because we want to? The story is told that one day a beggar by the roadside asked for alms from Alexander the Great. And the man was poor and wretched and he had no claim upon the ruler. But the emperor threw him several gold coins. And a courier was astonished at his generosity and he commented, Sir, copper coins would adequately meet a beggar's need. Why give him gold? And Alexander responded in royal fashion, Copper coins would suit the beggar's need but gold coins suit Alexander's giving. What's your philosophy? Now, our culture acts like we've got to hoard, we've got to hold on to things. Okay, I'm going to come back to QVC. Any of you ever watch that? To get you, okay, this, is, this cracks me up. To get you to order, they will say, you know what they'll say is, we have a special color. <laughs> you can only get this mixer here in purple, nowhere else. And you know what? I've sold 350 of them, and I only have 27 left. <gasps> so what do you think? Well, some of you are rational, right? And you think, oh my gosh, I, don't, I already have a mixer. But some of us think, oh my gosh, I want the collector color. I don't have one in purple. And I do deserve it, right? And you want to order it. And you've got to order what? Fast. You've got to order right now. Not giving you, I'm not giving you a hard time for ordering on QVC, okay? But I do think it's funny how fast they tell you to order. I read this week about Eunice Pike working with the Mazatec Indians in southwestern Mexico, and she said she discovered some interesting things about them. And these folks seldom wish someone well, and they're hesitant to teach each other. 
And if they're asked who taught you to bake bread, the village baker says, I just know, meaning he acquired the knowledge on us without any help. And he says, Eunice says this odd behavior stems from their concept of limited good. They believe there's only so much good, so much knowledge, so much love to go around. And so to teach another person means that it might drain your own knowledge. To love a second child means you have to love the first child less. To wish someone well, have a good day, means you have given away some of your own happiness, which can't be re reacquired. Jesus says the opposite. He says in Luke 6, given it will be given to you. A good measure pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be put into your lap for the measure you give will be the measure you get back. The point Jesus is making is that by giving, the giver is blessed. Giving brings us joy and gives us a sense of fulfillment and meaning. Think about this. What brings you more joy, to open a gift or to watch someone open a gift that you picked out especially for them? I was especially thinking as I was writing this about those of you that have grandchildren, right? You bought them something special and you just, what, right? You are so filled with expectation. You're like, I can't wait until they unwrap this, right? You're thrilled. Pastor J.D. Greer says, if you're not generous, you've never really experienced the gospel. If you feel guilty about how little generosity you show, you don't understand the gospel. It's impossible to really experience Jesus and not be radically generous in response. When you know Jesus, you know his, his kingdom is the most beautiful, the most lasting reality in the universe. You begin to find your significance in that, not what you possess, you recognize Jesus, not money, is your security for the future. And when you are truly saved, you have some sense of how gracious God has been to you. Adam Hamilton says, we were created in the image of God, and God is generous, a generosity seen most clearly on the cross, where the selflessness and love of God were poured out for all of humankind. Because we were created in the image of a generous God, we were created for generosity to be the regular rhythm of our lives. I think about this. How are you when you tip? Are you stingy with tips? Do you, do you try to get people down to the absolute rock bottom when negotiating a purchase? Or do you find a fair price for the seller and for you? Do you give generously when there's someone in need? Have you ever given generously to somebody and the other person has no idea that you gave? You know that is one of my favorite things. Blessing someone anonymously. I think, how do you respond when you get the stewardship letter and pledge card in the mail from our church? You know, this Lent, we've been looking at our hands, and I want you to look at your clenched, dominant hand. And this, this represents your giving to God through the church. Because together, our generosity makes possible the ministry of this church and its witness in the world. You give, there are people around, around the globe that know Jesus Christ from your giving. We give because we love God and we believe that God has blessed us richly and we desire to give back. Now the fingers of the open hand represent five acts of extraordinary generosity toward others each month. We are, we are meant, I love Adam Hamilton talks about this, we're meant to practice generosity every day the way pianists practice a new piece until they know it by heart. When we practice generosity over and over, it becomes a part of the rhythm of our lives, and we come to walk more closely with God. Lord God, help us to be generous toward you and others, remembering your unending generosity toward us. Amen. As we come to a time of joys and concerns, a couple I want to share with um, with people this morning. Val Barron's has fallen a couple times. We want to pray for her. Pray that as she continues to do her dialysis as well. Are there others in need of prayer this morning? I have not been able to reach him, but I know William Barron's is in the hospital. and We'll continue to pray for him. Anyone else this morning? All right, let us go to the Lord in prayer together. Gracious and loving God, we thank you that you are an incredibly generous God. You gave it all to us. 
You sent your son, Jesus Christ, to be Emmanuel, God with us. You sent him to live the life we should have lived. He died the death we should have died. He was resurrected so we could be freed and forgiven. An incredible act of generosity we cannot even begin to comprehend. We thank you that you are loving and kind, that you are full of mercy, that you are holy and just, that you are our rock and our refuge. You are the God who sees and hears us. You are the God who sent Jesus to intercede for us, sitting by you interceding for us in prayer. Lord, there is nothing that you have not given us. Again, you've given us your most precious thing, and that was your son. Thank you for that. Lord, we do thank you and praise you, and we ask as we have so many times this Lent, to teach us to be more grateful people. Lord, it's okay to get, we know it's okay to get new things, but we also should be so grateful for the things that we have. We are, we have blessings from you that, again, we, we can't even count how high those blessings are. Thank you for that. We thank you for gathering us in this church today. We thank you for the freedom we have in Jesus Christ. We thank you for the freedom we have in this country. We thank you for um, those who have served our country well, who are serving our country, and the sacrifices they've made so that we can live in a free place where we can worship you anytime, any place we want to. Thank you for that. Lord, we do thank you for this nation. We lift up to you our leaders. We lift up to you um, the upcoming presidential election. We pray, Lord, for wisdom for all leaders at all levels, that they would have good people surrounding them, and that they would make decisions that are good for all people. We thank you, Lord, for the outpouring of generosity of time, money, and resources that come to this church from those who attend here. We thank you that we can not only keep the lights on, but that we can also send funds to missions all around the world so that people know who you are. Thank you for that. Thank you for including us in your work and in your ministry. Lord, as we thank you and praise you for all that we have, we also lift to you those who are in need of your tender, loving care today. We think about Val Barons. We think about William Barons. We think about those battling cancer for Maggie and Mo, for Shelly, Vanessa, for Tina. Lord, we know there are others in our congregation and in our community who are in need of your tender, loving care. And we pray for doctors and nurses, especially praying for those who are battling cancer. We think about those who are struggling with serious illness, ALS, Alzheimer's, any mental illness. We pray, lift up to you those struggling with addictions. We ask again that we could be your minister, that we could minister to anyone that comes our way, that you plant in our way, and that you would bring others to minister to them as well. We lift up to you those missions that we participate in. We think about I Servants, Operation Underground Railroad, for Christ Cupboard, the Pregnancy Center, for our local presbytery and our nationwide uh, presbytery missions. We think about Joel and Krista McCutcheon and Kati and Sophie, their daughters. We thank you again that we can participate in these missions and we ask that you would bring to our congregation any other ones that we could participate in. Lord, we lift up to you Laura Allen in need of healing as she continues to battle her tumor. Lord, we know that there are others who are in need of your tender, loving care today. And we take a moment in silence to lift up either ourselves or anyone around us who is, needs extra care today from you. Lord, you are a wonderful and magnificent God, and we thank you for everything that you have done for us. We thank you most especially for your, the gift of your son, Jesus Christ, and we thank you that we can pray by ourselves, and we can also have the power to pray together, and knowing that you hear and respond to each of our prayers. We pray all this in the powerful name of our Savior, Jesus Christ, the one who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, with cheerful hearts, we bring forth our tithes and offerings this day.
Let us pray. God, you've blessed us. Thank you for allowing us to bring back part of that blessing to give back to you. Help it to glorify you and to spread your name throughout this great earth. In your precious name we pray. Amen. Let's sing together, Take My Life and Let It Be. And now receive God's blessing. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine according to his power that is at work within us. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus through all generations forever and ever. Amen. <laughs>